But today's text is from Luke chapter 2, and it's a story found only in the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of Mary and Joseph bringing the baby Jesus to the temple, and as part of the process of uh, sort of what one did as observant Jews in the first century, it's fulfilling commandments um, given in Leviticus and in Exodus. And uh, Jesus was a story, he'll be circumcised, and then also uh, Mary will go through the purification ritual in the temple. And so this story is set early in the gospel, and it is a, sort of a sign of Mary and Joseph and Jesus uh, fulfilling the, the, the call and the commands of the Old Testament. So that, that's just one theme that I want you to, to be aware of. One of the things that's also interesting in this about Luke, which uh, I just want to mention at the outset, just so as you're hearing, you can kind of say, oh, okay. Um, and it's interesting, notice if you, you'll see some of the language used in worship, um, and so already you'll sort of say, oh, yeah, so worship ties together, use the language of Scripture um, already, and you'll, you'll hear it as familiar. Um, at one point it says that um, Mary and Joseph are going to offer uh, a pair of doves or two young pigeons as part of the, the ritual process. The detail is this, the normal requirement for an offering would be a lamb and a bird, but the way Luke is telling us, and he's following and quoting from Leviticus, um, the offering that they give is an offering for families who cannot afford a lamb. So as Luke tells the story, he gives this little detail, this is Jesus is born to a family that doesn't have a lot. And so Luke, who is a gospel writer, very concerned with the poor and the church's uh, support for those who are poor and the needy, uh, tells us right away, just a little detail, that Jesus ain't got a lot and his family doesn't have a lot to work with. So just want you to be aware of that. Um, last thing as we, we kind of go in, you may or may not be familiar with this story as much as you are with the, the rest of the story in terms of shepherds and wise men, but it may be very familiar to you because of two of the characters. Uh, Simeon and Anna. And now Simeon is, um, I know there's some Simeons in this church, and I know there's some Annas. Simeon is righteous and devout and who's been serving the Lord all his life. And Anna, as you'll read the description, she's uh, probably like Simeon, also uh, much older, and has spent uh, years and years and years in the church, or in this case the temple, uh, serving and praying and being dedicated. So I know there are a lot of Simeons and Annas in the church. So this is just the nature of a wonderful congregation is you've got folks like this. So the story may not be familiar, but the characters might be. Okay? Let's pray together for the hearing of God's word. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for the beauty of your word. Unstop our ears and open our hearts that we may receive your word and the message you hear for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name, he who is your word incarnate. Amen. Here now from Luke chapter 2. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. He went this also to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who is righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Jesus took him in his arms Praise God, and said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled about what was said about him, 
Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul also. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped me, worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I got to be honest. I'm not sure this whole Christmas thing is a good idea. Just put it out there, and I want to be honest. I think honesty is important. And I'm going to try to raise the questions about this. So using, I want to start with, uh, um, before we look at the text, I want to start by looking at a great sacred tradition, great source of, of theological sacred inspiration. Uh, it's a movie called Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Some of you may have seen it. I'm thinking you have, but based on the response. Talladega Nights is a story of a race car driver, and the scene that, that is, I think, very important for us occurs pretty early in the movie. It's the family dinner prayer. Family dinner prayer. Where Ricky Bobby, played by Will Ferrell, is leading his family in prayer, and it's his wife is there, their two children, her uh, father, and uh, Ricky Bobby's good friend and fellow car driver, Cal. And so the, all of them are gathered together at prayer. Now, Ricky Bobby begins the prayer. Dear baby Jesus, eight pounds, six ounces, so cuddly, he's off golden hair. And his wife and father-in-law can interrupt and go, hon, Jesus grew up. He's a man. And he said, well, I'm leading the prayer. And you can pray wherever you want. When you pray, you can pray wherever you want to. But I'm leading the prayer and I'm praying to baby Jesus. I like the baby Jesus best. What's wrong with that? Now, Cal, his friend, you know, supports him and says, um, yeah, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo T-shirt because that shows he's formal, but he's ready to party. And then he says, yeah, I like to, I like to picture Jesus singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with angel wings, and I'm out in the front row, hammered, drunk. Maybe not the most devout prayer, but... It makes me wonder, well, you know, what kind of Jesus do I want to pray to? The little baby Jesus, nice little baby Jesus. I'd kind of like to pray to a Jesus who doesn't ask me very much, doesn't expect too much, kind of gives me what I want, doesn't put any burdens of responsibility, lets me go about my day. I think that's the kind of Jesus I'd like. You see where I'm going with this, right? That's the problem with this is we think about us, what we love about this movie is that comedy is a great revealer. And when Ricky Bobby's praying to the baby Jesus, the Jesus he likes best, it makes us go, what's the Jesus that I pray to? Who's the Jesus I pray to? What am I leaving out? What am I missing? What am I neglecting? Because it's so much nicer to pray to an easy Jesus or a baby Jesus or one who's not telling me what I need to do and how I need to live, just kind of let me be myself. In the Christmas story, we get the eight-pound, six-ounce Jesus, but we don't get to control that. See, God doesn't have to do this. God chooses to be born. God chooses to be born in a humble family. God chooses to do this crazy thing of going around teaching people to love one another, to pray for your enemies, to live generously. 
God chooses all of that. That's the Jesus that is being born. Not the one I like to pray to or Ricky Bobby likes to pray to. And we know where the story goes. It's not just the birth, which is wonderful, but we know what happens. We know, the, you know to use Paul Harvey's phrase, the rest of the story. If you're a Paul Harvey fan from, from way back when. We know where this is going. Don't need to go through Good Friday, but I'm not going to forget it. Just put it in those terms. So we know this is going. We know even in this early part of the story, we can start to see some signs that this is not as simple as little baby Jesus. In the story, you should notice that there's this passage where Simeon, who's this wonderful hymn, he says, you know, I finally, you know, I've seen the Lord's Messiah. And he says to, to, to Mary, this child is going to reveal, you'll be rising and falling. And it's going to hurt you too. The sword will pierce your own soul. So Simeon, in this wonderful moment of celebration, is also being honest because he understands. He's a devout and righteous man. He understands that the work of the Messiah is much more complicated than just being born. Also, think about the other parts of the story. Think about Anna as she's been there 84 years old. 84 is a tough year. You know, it's tough. You're allowed, we're allowed to get old, but it's just harder. And think about being 84 in the first century. That's got to be really hard. I mean, it's, uh, what do you have to get you through your day? It just We take lots of medicine and supplements and all kinds of good stuff, but she's been praying faithfully for years. Simeon, too, is looking for the consolation, living in patience, rough, tough stuff here. And think about the story, not in Luke, but in Matthew, the story of the Magi. The Magi come, we love the story of the Magi, but there's this Herod character who's not exactly there to worship the newborn king. In fact, tries to do something else. Again, we don't need to go there, but this larger picture in the Gospels, in the story of the birth of Jesus, much more complicated and even ominous at times. So I'm just being honest. I'm not sure that this Christmas thing is such a great idea. And here's how it gets worse. So again, just being honest. Not only do we not get to pray to the Jesus we want to pray to, the one that you know, makes it easier for us, doesn't expect too much, the song of Simeon, the beautiful song where Simeon holds the babe and his child and now says, you're letting your servant depart in peace. It's got to be honest. The word that is translated there as servant from the Greek is doulos, which probably better translated as slave. Slave, not servant. Now, I say that not because I want to say, hey, I know Greek. Pastor Jason also studied Greek, studied Hebrew. That's what's expected of us. That's expected of preaching, that we take the word seriously. We spend time with it. We try to learn the original languages, which you guys can do too, right? Jason would love nothing more than you guys to say, hey, Jason, let's talk about some of the Greek words in the Bible. And you can find things online. There's great resources. Anyway, I say this because it is important. I think we need to be honest. We like to translate the word doulos, Greek word, as servant, because that sounds better. Okay, servant, I can see myself as that. I like to be a servant, that's fine. I can negotiate a contract. I can ask for higher wages. I can take time off, because I'm, you know, it's a different relationship than slave. Slave, I'm totally dependent, no freedom. All my life dedicated to what God calls. So I don't, I like servant better than I like slave, but it means slave. Just saying, just trying to be honest about this. And, you know, I'm just putting this together, you know, not only do I not get to pray to the Jesus I want to pray to, the one that makes things easier, I've actually got to do what he says. I mean, my gosh. I mean, uh, I like my freedom, okay? I'm American. I'm patriotic. I believe in my freedom. I'm free to do whatever I want, no matter how dumb. That's what it means to be an American, to be able to do whatever you want, no matter how dumb. Actually, being America, America is what happens when you give free reign and freedom to geniuses and lunatics. Just say it. That's what America is. So this whole Christmas thing just doesn't strike me as patriotic. It's just, you know, not very, okay. All right, you see, I'm being silly. Obviously, I'm being a little bit silly, but I want to do that in order to, to use the comedy, do a little bit of lightheartedness to bring out the serious point, the very, very serious point, okay? See, the whole Christmas thing you know, it'll be fine. You know, wouldn't be a good idea if the world's okay. 
Because that's what I want to look at. The world is whether the world is okay. Could it be great if the world was fine and dandy and I'd be free to do whatever I wanted to do? It would be great if there were no loss of freedom, a freedom to do whatever I want to do due to all the things in the news. Let's put it that way. Don't need to go there, but you know what I mean. Just like I don't need to go to Good Friday, I'm not going to forget it. I'm not going to forget the world. As joyful as I am and as celebratory as we are, we're going to not forget that. It's one of the things I loved about the, the hymn the, that we sang. Thank you, Nathan, for who chose us. But the beautiful reminder in the hymn that there's a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do in the hymn. Okay? And think about the grief share program that you all have. That's beautiful work. But it's a reminder that there is grief and loneliness. I wish that, what would it be great? Wouldn't it be great if there's no grief and no loneliness? Right? Now, our brief statement of faith in the, our book of confessions refers to the broken and fearful world we live in. And I think it's true. The world is broken and fearful. And again, I don't need to elaborate. Just if you're following the news, you know what I mean. But Christmas isn't really about burying our, burying our heads in the sand, or to use an image from Christmas, burying our heads in the wrapping paper which sometimes I'd like to do. Let's be honest. I'd like to just bury my head in the wrapping paper and say everything's fine. But I gotta be honest. I gotta be honest. So I ask myself, what's, this, what's happening at Christmas? Why are we celebrating? Simeon says, the heart, thoughts of our hearts will be revealed. And are we looking at the world honestly? Are we looking at the world honestly? Now, I take the prayer list of the church, the work of the Grief Share, other ministries you have as a sign that you are taking things seriously. You are looking at the world honestly. And I think that's really important. The prayer list is one of these times we just get to be honest. Lord, I'm lonely. Lord, I'm worried about. Lord, I'm tired of. Lord, please help. That's honesty. All right, well, it's New Year's Eve. You got your resolutions in order? Um, I'm thinking about dieting. I made a mistake this morning. I got on the scale, and uh, I discovered something. Um, eggnog is not as healthy as you think. <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought sugar, the, sugar, the sugar in eggnog is fat-free, right? And all the, the milk and the cream and everything is sugar-free. So, anyway, I learned a hard lesson this morning. How about your New Year's resolutions? They're usually good ideas. You know, who we want to be, who we ought to be. It's hard to, hard to think of a time, you know, New Year's resolution, like, I want to do something really dumb. I'm going to make sure this year, every day, I'm going to do something dumb and hurtful. No, we usually use New Year's resolutions are about being our best selves. Okay, so, we want to think about our New Year's resolutions, and how we ought to live. And I, I, to me, the really good idea of Christmas is less about my resolutions, though. It's about God's own resolution. The, long ago, God resolved to resolve the world. God resolved to make the world right. The really good idea of God, of God the really good idea of Christmas, is God's own resolution, his new creation resolution. I can use that language from the Bible, particularly Paul. Paul talks about a new creation. God's at work in Christ making a new creation. So it's God's new creation resolution that we celebrate. God resolved to make the world right by entering fully into this broken and fearful world. Now, little baby G, you know, Ricky Bobby's right in his prayer. Little baby G's eight pounds, six ounces is pretty helpless. And I think Mary and Joseph would freak out if he suddenly came out of the womb and just started talking. Hey, Mom, how you doing? But I think what he would say is what he says throughout the Gospels when he grows up. Do not be afraid. You ever notice that Jesus is always saying, do not be afraid? He says that right. That's what I think he'd say. Maybe just the look on his face. You know, the, the Christmas hymn, um, No Crying He Makes. You know, little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Like, yeah, that's got to be God. You know, my, little, my kids were, whoa, you know, they were crying a lot. Little Jesus didn't cry. It's going to be okay. You can handle this. Okay? So Jesus is born. He says, do not be afraid. 
Jesus is going to teach us how to live. And, and here's the part that, again, I think it's so important to, to think about Christmas and this little ominous signs, the tough signs at the beginning, that not just this nice, simple little baby, but even at the very beginning of his life, there's struggle, there is suffering, there's pain, and it's okay. All that's okay, because God's at work in the midst of it. God's fully at work in the midst of it, not looking down, oh, wow, look what you guys are going through, but looking up, like a babe looking into his mother's eyes. So it's okay. Don't have to back away from the pain or the struggle, the hard work in and out of the church. God's example in Jesus and Simeon and Anna, I love them. They give us the courage in their faithfulness, give us the courage to look at the world honestly. They give us that courage. Not only do they give us the courage to look at it honestly, they give us the courage to look at the world hopefully. We need to look at the word world hopefully. So God gives us that courage in these wonderful stories. So all you Annas and Simeons out there, because I know there are a lot of Annas and Simeons in this congregation this morning, the good news is God's resolution God's resolve to make the world right, and we, you and me, Annas and Simeons, we get to be a part of it. Thanks be to God. Amen.